So, you're a farmer or landowner looking to diversify into ornamentals, or maybe a potential grower looking to set up a nursery like this one here. What will you need to do? What challenges are you likely to face? To put it simply, where do you start? This film will tackle 10 of the most important questions you'll face when setting up and then growing your business. It features a number of growers and other people currently working in the ornamentals industry who are happy to share their years and in many cases decades of experience with you. We'll cover some of the basics such as how much land you might need or what cost you'll have to pay while we'll also cover some other issues such as how do you even choose which plants to grow. The reason I started growing plants was because um, it was my, uh, we had a bit of spare ground. I was working at the Dingle Nurseries and I started growing on the nursery uh, at home. And since then it's expanded to what I've got today. Smallest viable nursery is probably about two acres. For one person that would be, and if they were employing somebody they'd have to add a bit more to that. Initially we plan on starting with approximately one and a half acres. We plan on putting up four polytunnels to start with, with some outside growing space. We currently do have available to us 32 and a half acres. What we like to do with any uh, local grower, or certainly any new grower, is share our knowledge, which has been built up over 40, 45 years, we share our knowledge with them. If someone came to us saying they wanted to grow plants for us, then first of all, we would talk about how much ground they've got, what sort of ground it is, where it is, how much time they were willing to give to the project, because some plants take more time than others, and go and see their ground. From the start in February, it took us till mid-May to get to the stage we are at now. And at late May, we started potting and we were ready to go. The work started early February and it was all done in our spare time, evenings, weekends, bank holidays, days off. You need to get a digger in to do the beds. Um, you want them pretty flat so the water runs off evenly. And we put a ground cover down, this black mypex here, you can see, which suppresses the weeds and keeps the weeds down. So you've got a barrier between the ground and the plants you're growing. Um, and basically that's it. I mean, you have to put the irrigation in as well. There's quite a bit of an investment in the uh, pumps and the irrigation lines around the nursery. When we moved in here, there was, um, we're on a very high water table, so we're allowed to extract water from that up to a certain amount, which is 20 cubic metres. But we soon realised we're going to need a lot more water than that. So then we invested in a borehole. Um, we're very lucky here because the, it's known for a um, very good water supply underneath the ground, so we've got a very good water supply. And no, no issues with water at all now. My intention was to, always from the start, was to grow in pots, and so water was... Um, from the start a, a major concern to have enough water to uh, know that you can consistently water through the summer. So as we're on a well, my first concern was to have know that we'd have enough water to uh, survive over dry periods. Mains tap water coming out of a half inch hose pipe isn't, isn't adequate, it doesn't water quick enough. The tank itself is a 49,000 litre tank. It isn't the biggest tank, it isn't the smallest tank. The reason we chose to opt for 49,000 litres was to maintain that we got an adequate water supply in between rain, so we got plenty of capacity. Part of the charm of living in this area is that it's, um, it's quite isolated in many parts and although we're relatively isolated here, we are on a sea road so it has got a tarmac surface and so it is relatively easy for us to get out and people to get in. The roadway access is vitally important. Obviously we have to traffic up and down with forklifts, um, with heavy machinery. If it was soil based, the forklift would get stuck constantly. And obviously good access is key and vital to, to maintaining sort of um, good supply links really, especially when we have deliveries. Other than water on site, the only basic services we needed was electricity to run the pump with. We could have used generators, but with it being in close proximity to the property, we chose to put a supply in from the house to the nursery. 
The tunnels that we chose, we obviously went through all the manufacture, major manufacturers of commercial large tunnels and the supplier who we did choose, it was felt that that was the best tunnel because they offered the strongest structure given the factor on an exposed site. Biggest expenditures I have are on um, compost is the biggest thing and container pots and then of course then the starting material as well, uh, really the three items that cost the most money. The plan to develop in the future hopefully will include more polytunnels. We would like more glass houses if necessary, but obviously glass houses are a huge cost compared to the startup of polytunnels. To have nurseries in the area working together, we, we've, um, we can purchase much bigger volumes of pots and compost and get better prices on those things. The possibility of, of working in conjunction with other growers, if there are people who want the same sort of materials, I, I'm thinking particularly of compost, then there's the possibility that you might work together to get compost delivered, although you're still going to be faced with the, the problem of, of, of moving it from one central dispatch place to another. We could take advantage of bulk buying in conjunction with a dingle. Um, it does have its advantages, does have its disadvantages. Um, obviously our plastics, we want them on a certain week. I want my compost delivered in bulk bags, obviously they have theirs loose. Um, and I like to stick to my suppliers, I know how good the quality is, rather than buying in bulk and not knowing quite what your end product's going to be. We've improvised with certain bits of kit. Instead of having a potting machine, we have a dumper that we've, we've borrowed from a friend who isn't currently using it. And we use that for, for moving soil and goods around site and we also use it as a potting bench. And it's proved, out, proved to be very, very efficient. The container production side, I think, is an all-year job because it's, it's not just the selling side of it. You've got the production side, which takes you from, say, February through till uh, July, June, something like that and then you've got the selling side on top of that. So I think it's difficult to um, fit it in on a seasonal basis, the containers. The tree growing side of it, I think you could do seasonally. I think that you could run from November, end of October, November through to uh, end of March, beginning of April, depending on the weather. The nature of the things that I grow, they sell when they've got a flower on. So Alpines perennials, the great bulk of them will sell when they're looking best. So therefore I sell mainly in the spring and summer and it's probably, it takes all of my time uh, during that period, but over the year as a whole, probably half of my time. Not a huge amount of attention, but constant attention. You've got to be aware of what's happening to them. And so therefore you've got to keep your eyes open at all time. And so it's not the sort of thing that you can do in, 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 in periods and then forget a while, for a while. It's you've, you've got to have constant attention to plants, I think, really, to keep the quality, to keep the squirrels at bay, to keep the rabbits at bay, to keep the honey fungus at bay. All the things, plants are susceptible to lots of problems, and so you, you as a grower need to be on the ball to stop it happening. Running a nursery at this stage and our size is more of a hobby rather than a full-time job. Obviously, as we expand and we get bigger, it will become a full-time job for me and my partner. Occasionally, we feel that we will have to employ some part-time labour. As we get bigger over many years to come, it will be necessary to employ somebody full-time just to meet the day-to-day -day demands of running a nursery, i.e. watering, potting, delivering stock, whatever that may be. My advice to, to farmers wanting to grow ornamentals would be talk to other growers, visit nurseries, get experience, don't be afraid to ask questions, especially when it comes down to planning, composts, issues like that. Experience is a lot, but it's not everything. And as long as you can carry on learning, because you will face challenges, plants do die, they are living entities, you will overcome them and always learn from your mistakes. Check your crop every day. 
you know, it's a big learning curve for anyone who takes on something like growing plants. And it, and as long as they've got determination and uh, and they've got incentive to do it, it's a really good way to to get a business started. I mean, you have to walk around various sites like car parks and supermarkets and you'll see what plants are being planted and what regularly what people are wanting so you get a real good idea from that feel for that what you need to grow really an easy to grow plant which we sell a lot of are hedging plants they're easy to grow grow well here obviously they're native plants so they do grow well here there's a lot of the trees the British trees which grow very well in this area. I think you need to be on a quite a big scale for trees um, you need a lot of land I think the money's there to be made if you're willing to wait for a bit of an investment and give yourself a bit of time but um, I could see where the market was going almost in the fact that with the pots they are available to be planted all year so your cash flow is a bit better. I'm interested in the presentation of plants. It's quite old fashioned what I grow and I do individual hand done labels. At one stage I, um, I invested quite a lot in having um, machine made labels from borals, floroprint and that sort of thing and I realised that it was actually counterproductive because the plants looked as if they were mass produced whereas my niche as it were is making them look as if they're handcrafted. The plants we have in the tunnel have been sourced from various places. Some have been bought on the open market, some have been bought from Dingle Nurseries as two litre potted plants. Some of the plants that are in the tunnels I have grown from seed personally, some I've taken from cuttings from my own stock and it's key important to start with very very good material. You can't turn a bad plant into a good plant, you can only turn a good plant into a bad plant. People think growing plants is easy and uh, it's very complicated. You know, not just have you got to get the right starting material, you've got to get the pot at the right time, you've got to trim them back at the right time, there's a spraying to do, the watering to do, and you don't want to do, overdo any of these. Um, then there's the packing, if you pack them too quickly or too rough then you damage the plants. You know, then you've got to organise the transport, you know, and then hopefully at some point you'll get, get paid. So one or two challenges along the way there. So one of the problems with expanding our business really is acquiring land. Agricultural prices at the moment are very high really. We could quite easily have another acre of glass and fill it and sell the product, but the land situation is holding us back. As long as they meet the British standard for plants, then it's a saleable plant. So that's what you've got to aim for. They are set out quite clearly, and if you follow that, then you'll be fine. The quality has to be suitable for sale to our customers. Really, it's got, it's got to be the, the correct size and, uh, and healthy. Obviously, with delay-wise, uh, the weather was an absolute key factor. Absolute key factor. Um, not only from the groundwork point of view, but obviously from, from covering tunnels. Because, as you can see today, there's a slight breeze and that is not acceptable when you're covering a tunnel, especially with having overhead power lines as well. In the future, I think the greatest issue has clearly got to be climate change. I think protecting the plants from the elements, both in terms of how long they live, but also plants that have a, a more benign environment in terms of perhaps protecting them from the wind, will, 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 will grow better, will have, have better quality. So keeping an eye open to the potential environment, I think, is uh, critical. Overcoming the challenge, really, is is making sure that everything that we will need is there and ready to go as soon as we need it. There's no point sitting back on your laurels and then ordering things in sort of January that takes a month's lead time when you need them in February. And then obviously if the weather changes, that can all be a factor. It's a bit of a cliche really, but if you enjoy growing plants, there's a great temptation to just grow what you want to grow and grow in the numbers that um, you like. The, there's, the thrill of propagating often means that you grow more than you need. So it's, it's a bit boring and cliche, but it always comes back down to thinking of, of, of work out how many plants you can sell and then trying to grow that number rather than 
growing the number you want to grow and then looking for a buyer. The way I've constructed my nursery is most of the walking distances to lift the plants off the bed are short. So you're not traveling very far to pick the plants and put them in the, in the crates. So that reduces your packing time. You've got to look at all the aspects of the job. I mean, like I was saying earlier, we, we constructed the bed so there's not much time, you don't need uh, much time to go pack the plants. As a consequence, I don't need many staff here to pack the plants. It then also, when you come to potting, we've also constructed the beds, long, thin beds, so we can run the potting machine down the side of the beds and just pot the plants as we go. So there's very little, I need very little labour to pot a lot of plants in a day. We never really faced any major problems. It was just predominantly our own cautiousness to get things right. And at key points that we did need an extra pair of hands, friends and family and everybody that could help did come and help. When we do bedding in here in, in sort of March, April, May, we do fill every square inch and sell it, but we're almost holding back because we could do more. Well, the, the biggest advantage of having something like this grown by a local nursery is that you know the hardiness of it. It's not been grown somewhere where its natural temperature is, you know, 25 degrees on a regular day. This is something which can be grown anywhere in the UK and it is fully hardy. An ideal size piece of land would be five to six acres and, and starting small, using an acre at a time, developing it. you almost got your, a ten year plan really of expansion. Obviously if the business is doing well you will expand each year. When people want to know what's the best time to start or what's the return, that really very much depends on what they're growing and obviously you want to plant plants best time is is in the winter when when the plants are dormant the amount of time it takes to get a return it definitely depends on what you're growing and at what size you sell the plant how quickly it grows obviously when something takes longer you get more money for it I think farmers looking to diversify it is potent there's potential to diversify into plants. A lot of the requirements in the nursery trade are similar to farming. You need know, tractors and a bit of machinery and some reasonably good flattish land. The stuff used on farm like diggers can be used on the nursery. So I think there is potential for farming to move into the ornamental sector. I think there's a big market for for plants. Bigger because like I said, I think I could well Boot and Co do four million in Holland. You know, so we're, we're doing a million. So, hopefully, plenty of practical tips to help you along the way. From fairly straightforward advice on water supply and road access, through to more technical guidance on such as whether you use a pondly tunnel like this, or a glass house, and whether you self-propagate or not. The best advice we can give you is to speak to as many growers as you can. As you've seen in this film, there's an absolute wealth of knowledge to tap into. And in general, growers are really friendly and more than happy to help each other out.